Hey, g'day. This is part two in my series on creating an Orange Pi MIDI controller. Uh, before I actually create the MIDI controller, I'm going to finish off uh, the NTS1 based Eurorack uh, synthesizer. So, last video, I just made the basic uh, NTS1, and in this one, I want to put it into a Eurorack, uh, and then I can drive that with the Orange Pi uh, MIDI controller when I've built that. So that's the plan, so let's get going with uh, modding the NTS-1. So my plan for making the Eurorack module is basically to uh, make a front panel and probably a rear panel as well, so I can mount it in a, the NTS-1 into a Eurorack case. Uh, the trickiest thing is just making sure everything's in the right place, so to do that I'm going to use Fusion 360 to get the layout together. And I'll be saving the files uh, uh, online so, and I'll put the links down in the description of where you can find those if you're interested in using those as well. Uh, but the nice thing is by doing Infusion 360 printed out on a 3D printer is I can check that all the holes and everything are in the right location. And it also allows me to create a DFX file out of Fusion 360 that I can send away to I think send, cut, send and get a aluminium version of this front panel put together which I'll use for the the final uh, mounting of the NTS-1 into the Eurorack. So here I am printing out the model. Uh, one thing I found out was it's best to in Kera to say print it on as a raft and that way the, the holes and the small details on the front pa panel get defined a lot better by the printer. Uh, and here you see on the 3D printer I'm pulling up the the whole raft and the raft uh, ends up separating fairly nicely from the, the face plate. <laughs> I probably printed five or six of these uh, as I added m new features. Originally I didn't think I'd show the keyboard but then I decided it's useful having the keyboard even on a Eurorack module so I made a uh, a hole for that and then I had to find the location of things like the MIDI in and the in and out jacks as well on the on the panel. So as I went along too I decided that uh, I'd like to keep the NTS-1 as much in one piece as I could. So originally I thought I'd take the side panels and the back off but uh, decided it was easier to just build a front panel and a back panel and screw those in front of what the existing case so it, in theory I can uh, fairly easily take the NTS-1 off this Eurorack module and still use it uh, if I just want a portable synthesizer as well. Other things I changed after my original uh, plan and approach to this was to actually use a USB plug to get the power onto the NTS uh, 1 and again that allows me to keep all the original hardware together uh, so I didn't use the header that was on the NTS 1 uh, mainboard after all and I was just going to use normal phono plugs to get the audio in audio out and the MIDI connections to the NTS 1 as well and again, that's going to help in the long run if I want to take this off the Euro rack, then all I have to do is unplug those things rather than uh, uh, wires going to the, the main board of the NTS-1. So that looks hopeful. It fits into my Euro rack case uh, fairly well. Looks like I can... Uh, screw it into the front panel okay. The other thing I wanted to do uh, was uh, I'm going to run power from the Eurorack case up to the module and then uh, using the 16 pin Eurorack power uh, plugs that are in the case and then run that through the to the USB. Uh, just to keep all the pieces in, in place I just took the same approach as the front panel and just made a, a 3D print of a panel that I could uh, screw onto the back of the 
the NTS-1. So again, I can disassemble it later on if I, I want to just use the NTS-1 by itself outside the Euro rack case. Again, I'll put the design, I'll link to the design down in the description. So this will make it a bit clearer what I'm doing with this panel on the back of the NTS-1. Uh, so here you see the 16-pin Eurorack power connector. So that plug that's going to have a lead going to the NTS-1 will fit nicely into that panel. And then I'm going to run just a wire from that to get 5 volts to that uh, USB connector. Because of the rubber feet on the case, the back panel needs to stand a little further away from the the case than the original screws could reach, so I swapped out to uh, 25 millimeter, I think 8 millimeter long screws so I can get through to the case. There's still a bit of bending on that back panel, but it doesn't really matter, no one sees it. Uh, if I was really worried about it, I could put some spaces under those between the back new back panel and the other back panel uh, to make it even but again no one's going to see it I'm not going to worry about it so the other thing I want to do is have some nice uh, graphics on the on the Eurorack face panel and so I found there's uh, laser printable transfers that you could make uh, so first I got the layout for the printout uh, together uh, just using PowerPoint. Again, I'll put the link for that PowerPoint file in, but that gives you some uh, nice w labels you can put on the front uh, if you print it out in the special paper. I'll show you how to do that later on. So next I just had to make sure that uh, I was connecting to the right uh, wires on this USB plug. Uh, so I had a USB socket that had uh, the pinout uh, names on here. So I just used my multimeter to check that uh, I was connecting to the right place on the on the actual plug. Okay, the first big test is to check that I could actually power the NTS-1 off the Eurorack bus. So I must have got the wires around the right way. So once I'd got uh, a good layout for the 3D print version of the front panel, I went and saved it as a DFX file, that's what Send, Cut, Send uses. Before I sent it to them I had to use uh, a CAD program just to get rid of the construction lines I'd put in the DFX file. Uh, Send, Cut, Send doesn't seem to like dealing with those. So I saved that as a updated version of the DFX file. And then it's just a matter of going to send cut sends website, upload that file. Then you get a view of what that's going to look like. Um, that all looks good. So, and then when you request the metal version of this, you just uh, check it looks okay. Check what version of metal you want to use. I ended up using this 6061 version of aluminium. And I went with 1.6 millimeter thickness. So it was about seven days wait for getting that front panel. So while I was waiting for that, 
I started wiring up the the 3D printed front panel that I had just to make sure everything's all connect and get my wires cut to shape. Uh, once I've done that, I just uh, again put it into my Euro rack. Uh, things are pieced together a bit more. This is pretty much the final wiring and the con final connection to the Euro rack case. And two things I wanted to test was first that I was getting sound out of the output jacks. So I turned on the Euro rack case, make sure my NTS1 still fired up, and just used my little portable amplifier to test that out. So the other thing I wanted to test was that the effects would work on the NTS1, so using the input jacks on that. So I just used some output from an audio signal generator, fed it into the input of the NTS1, make sure I was getting sound and the effects working on the output. And I also wanted to make sure that my jacks were the left side and the right side of the audio input and output were all aligned. And all that seemed to work, the effects were still doing the right thing. And that may be more what I really use this uh, NTS-1 Euro module for uh, after I've done the testing, after using it just as a MIDI output device. I'll probably mainly use it as an effects unit. That's pretty good for that. So the last test I need to do with the Euro Rack module is just make sure it can receive MIDI. So I put together this MIDI jack. The diagram above shows you what gets connected. And then I had an old uh, MIDI keyboard and just made sure that I could send MIDI to the NTS-1. There's a lot of capabilities in the NTS-1. Here's the MIDI chart. Um, one of the interesting things is you can make a lot of control changes as well. So these are the decals I use for the faceplate. Uh, again, I'll put a link to the PowerPoint file I used uh, for putting these together. So first I was just printing them out on paper, just to make sure everything lines up. And then I used this decal paper. It costs a bit more, so I only wait. I used that once I'd got the layout right with uh, normal paper. Even then, my laser printer ran into a problem. It jammed after printing half the page, but at least I got two sets of uh, decals out of that and that should be enough for what I want to use it for. I needed one for the 3D printer front faceplate and one for the uh, metal one when it came. So to apply these, uh, they're just like transfers that maybe you used as a kid. You put them in water for 30 seconds. So I've sped this whole thing up, but uh, it was in the water for 30 seconds each one of these. And then you can just slide the, the decals off dry them off a bit and they attach pretty well uh, to the 3D printed uh, faceplate and later on you'll see they attach well to the aluminium one as well. So after drying them off and smoothing them out and getting rid of bubbles, I think that looked pretty good. That's the best I've ever done with a faceplate anyway, so I'm sold on the, using these decals to put labels on them. So it's a few days later, uh, I received the faceplates uh, from Send Cut Send, came nicely packaged up. Got all sorts of extras with it. It's 
So there's the two face plates. Even got a sour patch sweet with it. So from the look of it, it looks like all the holes in the right position. They're nicely finished. They were deburred and things as well. So I really didn't have to do much other than the grade of aluminium I selected. Uh, probably wasn't as polished as I wanted. So uh, before I finished off putting labels on this one, I polished things up. And basically I just used WD-40 with a scotch pad and rubbed it for a while. And it uh, seemed to get rid of most of the bumpiness on the surface of the polish after that. So it looks like things fit. So now uh, this time I'll put the labels on before it's in in the NTS-1, just makes it easier to work around all the things on the front panel. It makes it easier to slide around the decals to get them in the right position as well. So again, same method, put them in water for 30 seconds, slide off the decal and then just uh, dry out and push out any bubbles in the decals. So now just putting the whole thing together. So because it's an aluminium face plate, I put some uh, electrical tape over the the contacts and also for the front panel because it's going to be raised above the actual NTS panel, I used longer screws as well. So 2.5 millimeter by eight. I put a little washer between the aluminium panel and the NTS panel. I don't need sure whether not sure whether I really need to do that, but it just stopped it needing to bend quite so much. Not that it bends much anyway for this front panel. I thought it might take some pressure off that electrical tape. So I reinserted all the phono jacks in the front panel. Because uh, all these are pre-wired, I'm pretty happy that these are all going to work. Just had to make sure they didn't touch each other, so some of them I had to turn a little bit just to make sure the wires didn't touch. So that's looking good. You can see I polished up the front a little bit. And now it's just a matter of testing the whole thing in the... I'll test it with, with just a normal USB first, just make sure it's still all working. I haven't shorted anything out. I got a bit close with some of the rotary control wires there. They're still far enough that they don't contact the aluminium, but uh, I think if I was doing this again, I'd just make a bit more gap below those rotary controls so they don't touch the contacts. So here's the final NTS-1 in the Eurorack case. So all good with that. So next video, I'll get into actually building the uh, Orange Pi MIDI controller.